Welcome to Canada's podcast. Hi, this is Angela Fay from Canada's podcast, connecting Canadian and global entrepreneurs and the founder of Futurable, imagining and building places worth living for. In the past few years, there's been a resurgence in the idea of local communities focusing on food security and local foraging for food. The practice of hand gathering plants and animals for bait, money, or the table has long taken place. But more recently, top chefs have been popularizing the idea. Urban foragers have told lots of stories about going to great lengths to find wild food in big cities while rural foragers have access to an abundance of wild food, if you know what to look for. So why in an age where most things we want or need are only a few clicks away, do some people seek the thrill of finding their own food? Why do local commercial gatherers choose to pursue these ancient livelihoods when there are less arduous alternative careers? Well, today on Canada's podcast, we are listening discovering and engaging with Celia and Benjamin. Living just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia in a small town, Port Alberni, Celia and Ben are foragers whose calling is to help educate and maximize access to wild food. Lots of lived experiences that are deeply connected to foraging and their primary focus today is developing and scaling Forest for Dinner, which serves two purposes. Their business educates and provides experiences for people, and they're also food harvesting, manufacturing, and distributing. Welcome, Ben and Celia, to Canada's podcast. (laughs) Hello. Thank you. So let's start with a little bit of your entrepreneurial journey. And I know they're independent for both of you, you, and you've come together, but uh, just share some of your background and how you arrived here today. Uh, so me, I arrived in Canada for the first time when I was 19 years old. I came uh, in Quebec, in Montreal to be exact, uh, to do a, a bachelor in business. So I guess I had this in me and uh, I did uh, specialize more into like sustainable development, which was like kind of a new thing back then, because it's been 10 years now. <laughs> and uh, and uh, an entrepreneur, yeah, like entrepreneurship. So. Cool. Awesome. And Ben? Um, I'm coming from France as well. I, I mean, we met each other, me and Celia, uh, in Australia, but we had that in common that we both went to Quebec uh, to do our studies, even if we didn't know each other at that time. And so when I was uh, 20, I moved to Quebec to pursue a master in agroforestry, master degree. And that was pretty much the only place in the world where I could find uh, agroforestry courses. So I went there for four years. And uh, while I was there at University Laval in Quebec City, I uh, specialize in uh, non-timber forest products and temperate agroforestry. So for many years, you know, I, uh, I read a lot about foraging and white food and what we could do with it. And uh, later on in my life, uh, it ended up being, uh, being something we do actually for real now. And so have you had touched on experiences before starting your own business in foraging? Have you had other foraging experiences around the world? Yes, I, uh, I've been a forager since I was born, basically, you know, my, <laughs> uh, back home in France, you know, that's really, really common, at least to go a mushroom foraging as a family activity. And I was lucky enough that when I was two years old, uh, we would go pretty much every summer uh, in the Alps to meet my uh, grandma who had uh, a house there and we would go picking chanterelles and bolets and uh you know wild berries and nettles and uh you know i have picture of me i was like two years old in a patch of wild blueberries and already you know picking so many <laughs> and uh it, it followed me all my life you know I, I traveled a bit in australia and new zealand and canada and wherever i would go one of the first thing i would do is buying a, a book about wild food and what is uh edible on the land Mm. and start from there and it, it's a long journey but uh, everywhere i've been going that's that's one of my focus you know trying to to determine around me what uh, could be edible yeah the first thing you would do when we would travel would be like hey let's see the botan- botanical garden celia and learn about the plants and see what's edible over there so and uh kind of same for me like I grew up in the Alps and it's surrounded with like huckle mountain uh, mountain huckleberry sorry 
and um and that was just like a normal activity you know we don't we didn't even realize it was a thing until we realized people actually have disconnect so much about it and and in both your cases ben i mean doing it as a young as a young person and then it sounds like both of you have kind of done it as a recreation or hobby or fun activity while you were traveling and experiencing different places around the world that's a big jump from that to hey let's be in the business what what, where was the trigger where you realized there were opportunities i mean you know what what is funny is when i was uh when i was really young like still uh, around 10 you had to do like um, a training period at home you know like from school and you had to choose like what you would like to do in the future and go one week to try and get uh to find somebody that do a job and follow him and i remember when i was uh 12 yeah i went for um kind of forestry engineering and I follow that guy and like we call it garde forestier in French which is like a bit different than engineering but basically those guys were in the forest all day long doing some jobs related to timber and you know me my dream was like to be in the forest so I was interested in this career and like when all of a sudden you know about like 10 years ago I realized I I, I could actually be paid to forage like to basically be on a egg hunt every single day I was like, oh, that's the best of both worlds. You know, like, I don't even have to be an engineer to do that. I can find a way to go and harvest products here in the forest. Fantastic. Now, I, oh, sorry, Celia, did you want to add something? Um, yeah, I, think I, I, I would add that it kind of, we, we kind of went through a detour uh, before I ended up to like foraging. Because uh, when we met, we were working in, um, so I was traveling in Australia and we're picking fruits. That's how I met Ben. And um, it was really like conventional agriculture, uh, picking fruit uh, for uh, at a piece rate, which was something totally new for me. Um, you know, I used to work on salary and it was like a whole new world that opened up. And um, I think what I liked when we were doing this um, piece work job in the conventional agricultural like world was that you could become very efficient on what you do, like, you know, learn like right. the to harvest faster and everything. So we did that for a few years while traveling, but very soon there was something that didn't go right, right didn't feel right. You know, it was a lot mm -hmm. of like pesticide use. Um, the worker were not necessarily treated well. And after we ended our travel, we went back to, que uh, to Quebec and then we lived there for a year. And, um, I tried to find a job back into my field uh, after, you know, being so disconnected for three years of traveling, you know, it was kind of hard. And um, I remembered a friend telling me about moral picking and I was like, oh, like moral picking. And I told Ben about it. And then we kind of like jump into this adventure. So basically we got like we kind of learned that it was like moral harvesting in the west and we we're in the east so it was like all very like much like a gold rush you know like you have <laughs> very, like tiny little bits of information everything was super secret you couldn't find anything online about like harvesting morels or anything like that so you know it kind of like got our attention because we like adventure and at the end of this year we were like oh Quebec is too cold for me and let's <laughs> drop everything and go for the adventure. So we basically sold out all our stuff, took our car really big, yeah, bad car, <laughs> and we just took off for the morale harvesting adventure. So and I guess- And where did it land you? Where did the morale adv picking adventure land you? In Zama City, Northern Alberta. <laughs> uh, oh, what? <laughs> I was not expecting that. <laughs> It's uh yeah that was a, a big shock to be honest that was right like, at the end of the road in a really long 150 <laughs> kilometers muddy gravel road with bisons and we ended up in, in that tiny little town with just like a gas station and wow. everything around burned the, the previous year and that's why there was more else so that was a really big change you know like right so actually that that is an interesting question so are they kind of renowned as a morale harvesting location no it's just because like the the commercial morel harvest that's mm -hmm. uh, happens in western canada and western us um takes place in wildfires from the pre previous summer ah. so they they really okay. grow abundantly after wildfire just for the following year 
And that's why, you know, like big commercial companies, most of them based in Vancouver, will send field buyers in those areas of previous wildfire to try and get as many morels as they could. So the, the harvest location is actually changing every year for morels, which is adding wow. up to the adventure, you know. <laughs> No kidding. I, I, it's hard to keep track, maybe, if, if it keeps moving. I'm yeah, feeling like what's... this going back to nomadic lifestyle somehow. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's why yeah. we like, and that's why we made it a job. It's like, you know, me, I'm so excited, like, during the season to say, okay, where are we going to go and harvest this year? You know? And I do a lot of mapping over the winter to try and see the access and mm -hmm. how it burn and everything. And so that's, that's really appealing to me. But and, and just, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's just to add up with like what you say about the nomadic life. That's really like something we've discovered when we arrive like in the West. Is like we learn about this like very nomadic like harvesting cycle of like people traveling like for okay. you know, hunter and gatherer. We're traveling for to get their food, and you know we got mm -hmm. you know the morels. But then it was like, well, then then what you know, and then. After that is like the chanterelle season and the chanterelle season is where? Right. Well, Vancouver Island, you know, and that's how we end up here is because we just got hooked up with the lifestyle and uh, decided to follow, you know, um, the mushroom, you know, path. So or just for clarity, is there a consistent season then of mushrooms here in where you are now in Port Alberni or in British Columbia? Yeah, so morel okay. harvest is one of the single ones that is really changing place every year, while most of the other uh, products that we harvest, they grow back every year at the same place, okay. unless you cut the forest. You know. So they are, it's a regenerative yes. uh, crop. Okay, so and just for clarity, I just want um, for our listeners, I want to differentiate between foraging versus forage, because uh, when you Google forage, you know, in, in BC, according to the BC government, forage production is the production of plant material used to feed domestic animals, right? And so, uh, and it's used to help sustain beef, sheep, and, and the dairy sectors. It is not foraging. No. Foraging for us is the collection of wild resources off the yes. land. Yes. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about sustainable local food, right? That is, there, there is an um, undeniable movement towards that. And so you talked, Celia, a little bit about your experiences in traditional agriculture, um, you know, but let's, and some of the problems associated with, with that. What does foraging do that is completely different or has a different experience than traditional agriculture? And what leveraged assets do you actually take advantage of? Um, well, I think that one of the main difference uh, probably between like conventional agriculture and like foraging is that in foraging, uh, the the people are independent. They work for themselves. Okay. They don't have, you know, any boss or anyone telling them uh, which row to pick or when to pick right. from which time to which time. So I think that's kind of like the main difference is really this like uh independence uh um peace you know that different uh differentiate both worker um and as i've said a little bit like with conventional agriculture you know um it's a crop that is plant and uh you have to reharvest it at a certain time and you have to add up like you know most of the time some fertilizer pesticides or to kill like um you know any bugs or animals right. that you don't want around where uh with foraging it's pretty much harvesting what nature offers so it's um it's the fun part actually because you never really know what you're gonna find and it takes knowledge you know you need to learn yes. about like mushrooms you need to learn about plants uh when to harvest them at what stage and because you're self-employed, uh, you really have to do like a lot of research before you actually can like uh, go and harvest properly. And, and I, you know, I have, I'm having this flash of Alexander Supertramp dying in the Alaskan wilderness because he <laughs> ate the wrong plant from the guidebook, right? So yeah. I'm, I'm, that I, I, I just want to give you a lot of credit and a lot of um, appreciation for the knowledge that you would have as far as what is edible, what is not. 
you know, and this goes back thousands of years, really, of human history. And it's a piece of our maybe, you know, heritage that we are disconnected from generally. It took a lot of time. First, first world culture, right? I'm not, maybe more traditional or indigenous cultures are much more attached to the land, but it is something, as I heard you say, Ben, when you say you learned this in school, I have envy that your school was you know, progressive enough to actually teach you the values and the experiences of going into off the land and experiencing it. And, and don't get me wrong, that's a permanent uh, learning process. You know, it's like it's it's you can't take anything for granted in foraging and you have to be really aware that like, you know, some plants going to look different from a year to another one, depending on, the, on where they grow at the beginning of the season versus the end of the season. Uh, sometimes you will find them in an ecosystem, sometimes in another one. And, you know, every single year I I add a lot to my personal knowledge and I'm really far from knowing every single plant that I can eat. And that's, you know, sometimes people are kind of scared of starting foraging because they say, oh, there is so many things out there. But, right. you know, it took me about 35 years to arrive <laughs> to the stage I am where like now I feel confident to maybe harvest about 100 species by myself. But it's like one by one, you know, there is ways to start with really uh, easily re uh, recognizable plants, you know, like, for example, chanterelles on the island. And, and that's a good way to start foraging, you know, just with a mm -hmm. simple one. And while you're on the quest for the simple one, you're going to start to be used with other plants surrounding you. And at some point you're like, oh, these plants, I have seen it before, you know, like, oh, what is it? You know, I should look in a book. And slowly, you know, you develop the knowledge of the whole ecosystem. And that's where you, you start really to reconnect to say like, oh, I understand, you know, why this plant is growing in the middle? Why this one is more, you know, on the wet right. land? So can, how can traditional landowners get more involved in the, in the industry or the practice? Uh, that's, that's a really big question. Um, I think, you know, non, what, what we call a uh, forage product or non-timber forest product, which is basically everything in the forest that is non-timber, but has potentially a commercial value, has really been overlooked in the last 50 years, I would say. Um, because, you know, for example, the forestry industry or the natural resources industry like mining uh, were really strong economically, you know, and they they were really often the first one to have leads to manage the land, you know, and all those resources have been kind of overlooked because, you know, the, the kind of money they could bring in comparison with most of those big activities were peanuts, you know. But I think, you know, a lot of things are shifting. And as you say, you know, it be, can be local food. It can be, you know, people willing to reconnect with what they have surrounding them. And I think that's the key, you know, it's like um, there, there is a, a potential commercial value to some of those products. It doesn't mean we need to go and harvest every single plant that we see because it has a commercial value somewhere in Japan and it costs a lot of money and we're going to deplete the whole forest of it. It has to be, you know, managed and to be looked at, but there is definitely a lot of products, especially on Vancouver Island, that mm -hmm. to my standard can be harvested sustainably and can add value to the economy, to the local economy. So where, where I think it would be really important to put some effort is like if the, if the, the local governments or um, mm -hmm. the communities could uh, maybe spend money into research, you know, to see like, okay, what's, what's out there? Can we make an inventory of the resources? Mm -hmm. And is there a way to, to harvest this resource that is sustainable and creates economical activity here? And and just for clarification, uh, you are harvesting right now entirely off uh, Crown public land. Is that right? Yes, on BC Crown land. Yeah. And, and so again, I, I I see an opportunity there to open up the doors to more traditional landowners or even commercial, right? Private landowners or building owners. How can they? Um, how can they either connect with you or connect with? Uh, the idea of foraging as maybe uh, producing a, a premium product and it, maybe shifting a little bit away to the language around commercializing mm -hmm. and actually just popularizing, yep. you know, the natural food that the earth provides versus farming it, you know, yep. foraging versus farming. What do you, what do you think? I think it's, um, it's, uh, 
a lot of education you know it's because okay. it doesn't just come up like this you know if people are not aware that a plant is edible and can add up value to the land they won't go for it so first is really like you know convince people and educate people actually uh about what grows around them you know so then if they know you know um the potential use of a plant well maybe like they're not going to like cut down this tree where there is like mushrooms growing on the bottom. They'll wait 10 more years before cutting it down because they can get food from the chanterelles or they can sell them or they can preserve them. You know, there's many different like um, potential use. So once you have the knowledge, well, then we can have a conversation with those people about like what the value added, you know, with uh, their land and the products uh, that the, the food that grows in it. So, so it's what, really like more going yeah into like um um like a bigger vision you know yes. than just like uh, so let's just talk food. about that bigger vision because I want to ask you what in your opinion and experience so far what can be done from policy business development landscape what can be done but before we ask that question can you give me a size uh, and some scope on how big is this industry from the high level enterprise to the SMEs, to the, you know, the individual foragers that you talked about, what, how, how big is the foraging sector? So first, what is really important is like, it's a really gray economy where it's really hard okay. to get proper numbers. And right. uh, I mean, okay. I've been really interested in, in, into this question for years. So I, I digged into it and, you know, we have been first and seeing what's going on in the forest as well in like uh, large operations. And, uh, a lot of people here in BC are not aware, but there is many companies, most, most of them based on the lower mainland, that actually have a, a team of field buyers that uh, are traveling all across Western Canada, uh, buying some white products from independent harvesters. And we're talking about, you know, uh, probably a few thousand speakers that are actually, you know, nomadic uh, lifestyle and follow those field buyers. Um, some of those big companies, you know, they're in the 10, 20 million dollars uh, revenue per year. There's probably four or five of them. So, you know, it, it's really hard to say because, you know, there is the edible market, but there is also like health supplement and other markets that are opening up for, uh, mm -hmm. for white food or white harvested product. But, you know, my, my uh, interpretation, extrapolation is like it's probably around 200 or 250 million dollars revenue of like a BC based company uh, surrounding wild food products. So that's that's really peanuts in comparison with forest industry, but that's still providing quite a lot of jobs, you know. And there is there is those big guys, but on the other yeah. scope of things, there is really little company as we started, you know, just doing farmers market and harvesting by themselves, just two people, you know. And it's completely different. You know, some of those big companies in the lower mainland, their main market is export market. You know, some of them right. are probably about 80 to 85% export. And people are not aware of that because they don't see the product. You know, like uh, people are always amazed when I tell them, you know, oh, Canada probably exported, you know, 25 tons of dried morel this year. And people have no clue because they, they, they barely they find any morel in the shop. Yeah. But uh, on the other side, you know, you have some, some really little companies that are trying to develop the local market, uh, you know, working really hard, educating people on the farmer's market. And we're not the only ones. There is, there is several like us. And what is missing uh, to my standard here in BC is in between, you know, middle sized company yes. that can uh, have like maybe processed goods and can be kind of in between. Doesn't mean they can't do export, but maybe not only focusing on export. And we're looking at Quebec situation. And I think that's the way to go. That's what's what, what they have been trying to develop in the past. You know? and, and that's an interesting point. You do have some knowledge between the two different provinces because you highlight what it what it feels like in Quebec, who was maybe more progressive with their policies and, and business support. Uh, and what what maybe what more could we do here in British Columbia or other regions of Canada to support the sector? Yeah. And I, I like usually to compare, you know, when we arrive in Quebec uh, with the food sector, um, people knew Quebec for the poutine. And that was pretty much it. You know, you arrive in Quebec and what are you going to eat? You know, as French people, that's important what we're going to eat. And, and cheese. Then... <laughs> cheese and poutine. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like the squeezy cheese of the poutine. That was pretty much it. 
And now, you know, 10 years after, it's amazing. Like people go to Quebec to travel. It's a food destination. It's grown so much. Um, they've rediscovered their forest. They've rediscovered like the Boreal cuisine. They've make it as like uh, an argument to go and travel to Quebec. And it's great because then people go to like the, you know, further community. It developed tourism over there. It developed a whole system, you know, right with the food uh and that's i guess what's missing here in bc is like this uh this like uh, integration with uh businesses and tourism and all these potential activities and um and we've talked a little bit about this but it also for uh providing jobs you know it's a very important piece because mm -hmm. In Quebec, what they have is they have like professional association for pickers. They train those 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 person before they go into the woods. So they have like a respectful attitude uh, when they go and forage for food. Well, and I think something that you've shared with me that I'd like to reiterate for for listeners is, you know, something that's important to you. You have a deep respect and appreciation for the land. Right. And it's and it's kind of core to who you are and and maybe if it was core to more humans and we had more you know hands on the ground experiences i think we would um dispel a lot of biases about you know fears of not uh you know maybe wild food is scary or um you would you know have a much deeper sense of appreciation for nature and and your local environment the differences really between say port alberni versus northern alberta <laughs> versus quebec uh, wild foods. Yeah, yeah no, but, you know, it's, it's all about education. Again, you know, like we have young children and they just feed from what we show them, you know, like if you act well and behave well and say hello, well, they're going to follow it, you know, or children for them, the mushroom is not a mushroom. It's a chanterelle or it's a morel or it's, you know, they know the name and at a very, very young age, they can start, you know, uh, yeah. And it becomes just natural, you know, for them. So I guess it's the same for everyone uh, around us. You know, if we teach mm -hmm. them properly uh, how to respect the land, how to know and how to care about the environment, well, they will integrate it in their lifestyle and then become natural. And then we don't even think about it, you know. So I think that's really like our ultimate goal for with our companies really to like, uh, share like our knowledge so it it becomes something that is just um I, I, and I think that's imperative so I'm just going to take you up on the I've got a 12 year old girl and 14 year old boy that are just you know they've been exposed to the next generation and plant-based eating and what it means and some of the you know more traditional agriculture ways that we need to you know, transition out of, not immediately, but just transition out of. And so I would love to take you up in the offer. I I'm, have the privilege of being somewhat proximate to come experience and bring my kids to hang out with your kids in the forest. So yeah. we will do that at some point we'll in summer. Sure. No problem. <laughs> but before we, I want to talk just a little bit about, uh, I know BC, maybe there's still room to become more of a food, um, food technology and, and food natural place. But Vancouver Island's pretty special, which is where you are. There is a there is a sort of renowned uh, global positioning as you know for Cowichan Valley and and Courtney Cumberland to be a bit more foodie specific. Yeah. And right there in Port Alberni, you now have a food hub. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, that's actually an opportunity that show up. You know, that was really random that we ended up being. Uh, <laughs> part of this project but uh we had heard from a really good friend in port alberni who is uh, really involved in charities and in food charities especially that uh, there was this plan about creating a food hub and it was kind of shady you know i didn't know exactly what to expect and <laughs> at some point you know because she she insisted about two three times at some point i'm like oh yeah i should google it you know and i started to google it and found out about like uh, the, the bc food hub project you know and the subsidies mm -hmm. they get from the bc government and uh I found out that there was a meeting two weeks later, and that was the last meeting before they would start operation. So we went to that meeting and, uh, and you know, started to explain what we were doing and, uh, and everything. And like they say, yeah, that's a perfect fit. Like, do you want to lease in the food? Uh, we were like, oh, what, what, what's commitment it is, you know? <laughs> and, okay, I'm not sure, like, how big is the lease? What are we going to do there? But we, we always had dream, you know, about, like, trying to, to scale up 
to to be able to process what we harvest, you know, because right. we have been harvesting a lot of different products, but you're always limited when you just need to sell them fresh, and that's really really seasonal products, and to preserve them. You need you need a, a proper facility, and we had we had that at the back of our mind. But you know, it's like the the expense related to creating your own facility uh, to food safety standards, mm -hmm. and you know, buying all the equipment and everything was kind of something that was deterring us. You know, even if we didn't really go too hard in thinking about that kind of project, we knew it would be like maybe one hundred thousand dollars investment, and we weren't sure to commit to something that is so experimental and new. You know? Right. And with that project, with the Food Hub, the Food Hub goal is basically to provide a facility or a space to local food producer to either scale up or having some innovation in the, in the food product. And that was exactly what we were looking for. Okay. So on top of having our own lease, um, they decided to create um, a part of the Food Hub is actually uh, a commercial kitchen, kind of commercial processing kitchen where they equipped it themselves with, a, uh, with, a, with some of the money they got from different grants. And they basically asked all the potential tenants, so we were one of them, what would be your dream equipment there that maybe some product you think of you could be producing? And I was like, oh, uh, I don't know. I need to check. I need know? this and this and this. <laughs> and so basically we, we sent them a list of, of equipment we were thinking we would be using in the future, and they just bought it you know, and installed wow. it. Fantastic. And now we're uh, we're facing how to use it, you know, <laughs> like uh, and so that has been a, a big learning curve in the last year, you know, to try and say, going from you know just on base business doing the farmers market to okay, what we're gonna be right. actually able to process there in what quantity and how we can get things organized so it might have a chance to be viable in the future. And so I'm hearing really that the the beautiful place is helping you to scale affordably um and I, I appreciate so i i'm not sure how to find it I, by the way i have looked for case studies of innovation hubs and in particularly food hubs across canada and there is a very distinct lack of them but yeah. you know what do you think should other communities start food mm -hmm. hubs and if so why I think it's um, uh, a new, fairly new movement here in BC, um, but it's growing. It's growing and it's good. It's going to become, it has to become actually the new normal. Because I think what the pandemic has made us realize is that we've been completely disconnected with like our food supply and we cannot be independent, uh, like dependent actually uh, from uh, other country too much. And especially it's really in the case of Vancouver Island, you know, there's just so much food, so much abundance here, uh, really at our doorstep. So, you know, we need to be able to transform and reappropriate ourselves, uh, the, the food that is around us. And, but the food hub, for instance, in Perburn, it's really more based around like uh, seafood. So we were kind of like right. the more terrestrial addition. So that's why we get like, you know, um, kind of a place of uh, choice. Uh, but I, I, you know, for instance, for the fish, um, I remember when we when we were living in Port Bernie, uh, the, the, you could not buy any fresh food, you know, a fresh fish, you right. know, it would just right. be fished in the in, in lead, get shipped to Vancouver and whatever is not sold over there would go back to uh, like retail for. It was just, you know, really silly, ultimately. It made, it made no sense. So I think those food have really helped uh, to promote local food, local economy, because it also provides jobs to, you know, people around uh, around the community, which is very important for community like Port Bernie. And um, it's it's developing in lots of different cities uh, across the island. And I think that ultimately that's that's very important and great that it's happening. And that's how you can maybe on the, on the long run um create affordable local food because that's one mm -hmm. of the issues as well you know it's like uh to be honest you know a lot of people can't afford local food because it's too mm -hmm. expensive we have been doing the most street market for seven years now in victoria and it's not cheap to buy everything on the market and even if some people would love to do so it's not easy and what the pandemic made us realizing is like what you see as cheap food at the supermarket is is 
it's kind of hidden price, you know. It shouldn't be it shouldn't be that price. If it's so cheap that because it has been harvested by foreign workers that were weren't paid properly, or that because it has been using really huge lands and really huge uh, you know scale. And I think you know if we develop and we put money to develop the local food system maybe we can end up with something that is a bit more affordable, yeah. not as much difference in pricing with the, uh, the imported goods. And I think that's a really important way to develop local food. And don't get me wrong when we say before, like BC uh, maybe is lacking food culture in some places. I One of the main reasons why we're in Vancouver Island is like, you know, there is a lot of things going on about uh, food security and mm -hmm. innovation. And I mean, we know a lot of small companies here on the island, either farmers or like cheese makers or uh, beekeepers. And that's really exciting, you know, what everything is going on. Yeah. But still, you know, if you really look at the raw numbers, the statistics show that what is consumed in Vancouver Island and that actually comes from Vancouver Island right. is still really little. There is a lot of room. Absolutely. There's, I think, I think, I don't have it statistically right, but I, my understanding is something like 92% of our food yeah. is yeah. imported. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm part of a, a group called In Island Innovation. It's a, it's a global group of uh, economic developers and consultants in, uh, in trying to grow island-based economies. Yeah. And they're all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. Literally, they, you know, they have to import. They're completely self-reliant. Yeah. on uh or, or externally reliant on imports and so foraging could be another solution right and educating in in these micro environments in other places as well as you know your own business that's yeah. a huge opportunity there i want to um just kind of wrap up really we had two goals between us we wanted to shift the conversation from you know, maybe perceived biases or fear from from wild food being wild and unattainable or not a solution to feeding local populations and making sure that we are looking to shift that conversation into one of abundance. Yeah, I just clearly think we did that today. And the second one is shifting the food system. And, you know, Ben, I know you're passionate about trying to you know, keep as much domestic trade as possible versus, you know, a bit like the your example where we're exporting so much and the locals don't have any access to it whatsoever. Is there anything else in either of those goals, shifting the conversation or shifting the food system that you'd like to highlight? Um, yeah, I think you, you, you got it right. I think like as a business, our ultimate goal is um, to leave comfortably from uh, our job, uh, you know, we don't want to work for nothing, uh, but we don't need like so much, you know, we don't need to go with like big export nonsense ultimately, you know, I think there's like really a middle ground where we can live well and we can enjoy the land, we can respect it, we can have like a connection with the community around us, uh, provide jobs uh, and just live happily, you know, all together in like a nice, it. it sounds silly, but it's really what I believe ultimately. Simple living. The goal of, uh, of, our, of uh, our, you know, what we do. And Ben? Yeah, I think, you know, me, what is really, really important in getting into that new facility and, uh, and starting processing is like, so we want to try and go into retail, you know, with some of our products. And it's like, I remember when I was at uni, you know, like a lot of our, our teacher in forestry were telling us, like, we need to add value. We need to add value. We need to add value. You know, the problem is like raw uh, product export. And, you know, that is the case uh, in Vancouver Island for raw log export. There's been a lot of, uh, you know, conversations surrounding it. And I, I'm, I'm really glad to see that in Port Alberni, they, they developed a new meal that is actually transforming product for real. And it's going to give value-added products and jobs, local jobs, you know, instead of exporting the job. And I think, you know, even so the foraging industry is small, uh, I think it does apply to foraging industry as well. You know, mm -hmm. there is resources there. And instead of, you know, it doesn't mean we, we can't do export and we did do some export and we might keep doing it in the future, but there is room for 
adding value to the product. And that's really what Absolutely. we want to try to do is showing like, yes, there is resources, but yes, we can do something. And maybe with a French background, you know, like gastronomic, we like to try new jams <laughs> and new pickles. And, and that's maybe one way of adding value. And there is maybe many other ways. But what I think is important is focusing on like whatever resource we have, natural resource, can we add value to it before selling it? You know? Well, and I have the privilege of actually knowing because we've talked before, but just because we're in this conversation, can you give me some examples of value added from your product other yeah. than just the raw food? So, for example, we are working right now on some uh, marinated pickled chanterelles. So something that you would have for an appetizer or like with a glass of wine and, and cheese platters. And just, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, yes, yeah, something, you know, preserved in a glass jars and you can you can sell it year long, you know, instead of just having like some some raw fresh chanterelles, and that's that's something really good. And there is tons of ideas, you know, like uh, like there is so many chefs that have ideas about food development and food innovation. Right. The question is just having you know the equipment and the organization to do it and to actually sell right. it, you know. Or um, even our jams, you know, like our wild berry jam. We have a you know decided we'll stick just just to eight, but there is many more we could do. And I mean, it's Again, creating that conversation with people around us because people don't even know there is like mountain calberry here growing in abundance in, in the island. They don't know what a red calberry is. So with like a product that everyone knows and use and that is easy to appreciate, well, you create that conversation, you create that knowledge, you know, and pass it on to the different generation and then you care for your place. So it's a really good tool to use food uh that everyone enjoys and knows and just uh to to yeah and one of the ultimate goal of the food app is actually to you know communicate in between tenants and different industry yeah. to actually maybe develop some product together you know like mm -hmm. uh absolutely know, they're doing smoke fish on one side. We're doing uh, spruce tips on the other side. Can we do something together that, like, Absolutely. you know, highlight all the products from the island? Yeah. And, and really, that's the, you know, it's the ultimate maker space, right, is where collaboration has happened. Is there still room for people at the food hub? Uh, <laughs> there is. There is. Uh, so not as in short tenants for now, but of course, this commercial uh, processing kitchen is open to any business that's... Cool. Uh, that is in the valley and anybody that would like to you know innovate test some new product or even you know process a product there they can book some hours there and do that yeah. and it's really affordable and it's it's great it, it's great that emulation you know when there's many people around you uh, i'm imagining a tasting dinner where i get to come and test yeah. the seafood and test your chanterelles and yeah. you know and that's a, they, they, they probably you know one of the goals as well is like developing a retail shop at the food hub itself and maybe Absolutely. a restaurant as well showcasing yeah. the products for sure celia benjamin it has been a pleasure i've learned an awful lot about foraging that i was not aware of the size and scope of the industry the values and opportunities for local communities to hopefully build their own food hubs and support more access and education to wild food yeah. Thank you for stimulating the conversation. How can our listeners get a hold of you post podcast? They can go on our Instagram or Facebook account. And the website right now is uh, in process of redesigning. So soon they're going to be uh, having access to a brand new website. Okay. And can you give us actually spell it out for us? So maybe Facebook is Facebook slash forest, slash forest for dinner or Instagram. Just uh, put in the search engine like forest for dinner. And awesome. for the website for us for dinner.ca. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Thanks for joining us on Canada's podcast. We'll see you again soon. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Bye. Bye.